Welcome to The Inside. This was the week Hollywood set aside its business to prepare for the Academy Awards. Encouraged by strong box office results for The Batman, which has now crossed over the $500 million mark, the industry is looking forward to a healthy year of hits, including new films from Marvel, including Doctor Strange, and from James Cameron, who will deliver the long-awaited sequel to the biggest box office hit of all time, Avatar, in December. I am Jim Chabin in Los Angeles, and with me is Wim Byans. He serves as CEO of Senionic, and he joins us live from Brussels, Belgium, where it's evening. Good evening, Wim. Hey, good morning, Jim. Good to hear you. Wim, everything that we talk about, uh, every conversation we have right now is against a backdrop of a terrible war that's going on in Europe. What's your perspective from Brussels? You've got the heads of NATO uh, assembling there, a great deal happening. What's your view at this particular point? Well, I think it's uh, we're very close, right? I mean, it, it's in our backyard, like we say in Europe. Um, it is amazing how many people are moved with it. The human, I think, disaster is huge. It's millions of people which are refugees as we speak. Just to put it in perspective, Ukraine is a country of more than 44 million people, right? I cannot say more than, than from my side, but also from us as a company, we are really condemning the war, right? It, it's a war we think is at, at, at the wrong merit. And again, condemning the war is very much about the, the regime and, and the people behind the war. But the thing we, we will have to do as a as a nation, as Europe, is to take care of our people. And, and that's what I hear uh, echoing all around in Europe. How do we take care of this crisis? And then trying to create comfort for the so many people which are you know, on the streets, refugees being in, in different countries and, and being brought to different places in Europe. We all need to help. Um, so it's a real, uh, a real crisis in our hands, and we're really, really, we're really feeling with uh, the people um, which uh, are really suffer uh, the hardest here. Everyone is saddened that this kind of behavior can still go on in our world, and uh, we hope for the best. We hope for the best. We do, we do, we uh, we very much do, and I hope that um, common sense prevail and that we can uh, help the people as good as possible right now, and that that's. If common sense prevail, uh, we can, that the country can be built up again uh, and that we can be one Europe like it should be um, versus uh, what's happening at the moment. But uh, yeah. Right. In peace. In, in peace. peace. Absolutely. Wim, uh, Hollywood, if there, are, if there are any weeks in, in, in Hollywood where things kind of shut down, Oscar week is one of them. It's the time of year that everybody really does stop what they're doing and participates in the annual tradition of the Academy Awards, and it becomes something that is exciting because everybody knows someone who's going to be at the show. Uh, you know, Hollywood at the end of the day is a relatively small town. What do you make of, uh, do you watch the Oscars? Is it something that you follow uh, from Europe? Well, we watch the Oscars, but I think we watch it slightly different. I think there is more warming up happening in, in Hollywood, right, uh, weeks beforehand. I think what I see is get a lot of attention is the Oscar show himself, right, where people stay up watching it. Uh, people are definitely very keen on knowing who won and who was, you know, who didn't win kind of thing, right, from the nominees. So, so that definitely plays, but it's exactly that event as such, right? And specifically, I think that the most important part, it's a moment when movies are in the picture, right? When people are talking about movies, people talk about behind the movies, and independent who wins, right? That talking is good because it, it brings that stories around, uh, which makes people curious, and then later on goes to a movie and want to see things. And that's really, I think, what, what makes it uh, an important event and really something to look forward to. I see as many Oscar contenders after the Oscars <laughs> yes. because I'll see a movie or I'll see an actor or actress or I see a clip and I think, that's a movie I want to see. So at the end of the day, it's a terrific, it's a terrific marketing tool for the motion picture, the cinema industry. Jim, we have the perfect guest for our show. Pete Hammonds is considered the Dean of Award Season Commentators. He writes for Deadline Hollywood, where his articles are read by Hollywood insiders and fans alike. He has also served as a governor for the writing branch of the TV Academy, where he has nominated for the Emmy Award for Television Writing. Welcome, Pete Hammonds. Hi, how are you? Pete, there's been some speculation that certain kinds of mid-range movies like romantic comedies may disappear for cinemas. How do you see that? 
Well, I do see Netflix and others uh, sort of putting a lot of that on, uh, you know, the streaming services now. And I've heard that uh, it only takes the next big one, you know, a couple of major stars to say this is going to be theatrical. And the way I, I see that is George Clooney and Julia Roberts are making a movie right now for Universal that will come out uh, later this year in the fall. And that's a big romantic comedy seeing those two stars doing that again in that genre, I think can revive it. Comedy is a great thing uh, for theater. So I hope it doesn't become exclusive sitting on your couch watching these things on streamers. I don't. I, I hope that mindset will go away, but it takes one big hit, as you know, to sort of change minds and say, well, that worked. Okay, let's try that. There have been observers that think that studios would be well served by owning their theaters, right? Like we, we used to, you know, in the old days. Do you believe that that companies like Disney or Netflix owning their own cinema change is something which potentially will happen? And is that is that a benefit you believe? I, I you know, I don't. I think that we got rid of that for a reason, uh, <laughs> and I, I don't think that that's a really good idea to once again have ownership by these these companies. That is going to become one big company. It's all going to be Disney and offshoots of them, uh, you know, and they'll decide what goes where. And I think they've made some bad decisions in in recent months uh, regarding what goes to streaming and what doesn't. I mean, we've had three Pixar movies in in a row go straight to streaming, not even an attempt to put them in theaters, which are begging for this kind of content. I think the companies, if they were in charge of everything, then we wouldn't have any kind of choice or any kind of uh, guidance to make theaters what they should be. Pete, I want to ask you about the, the awards, the Oscars and the movie industry. What do awards do for the movie industry at a time like this? This is a big week in Hollywood. Yeah, it's a very long award season that started a soft start, actually at Cannes, which was in July this year because of the uh, pandemic and coming back, but definitely with the fall festival. So it's a long time here this season, and it, and it's very important for specialty movies, for smaller movies. They live or die on, on critical acclaim and awards attention, which is why there's so much on this. I think it would have been nice to nominate a Spider-Man, which I thought was very deserving. I thought it was a, an incredibly innovative way to do the eighth iteration of a Marvel uh, character, and, and they didn't. I thought it would have been great to see a James Bond movie, this one, because I thought it was a risky film and very interesting, deserving a best picture. I think, uh, you know, the what's missing at the uh, nominations here is that that's really going to draw the audience back in here. You know, much as I really admired Drive My Car, a three-hour Japanese movie about a, uh, a, a director going through grief, traveling to Hiroshima to do a production of Uncle Vanya, isn't going to make people tune in to the Oscars. It's nice that they could nominate that and international. But what the Oscars need to do is what it always had when it was the only game in town, a big tent recognizing all kinds of movies rather than just a type of movie, a smaller type of movie. And the audience has dwindled. So it's not as important, but it is important. It's important for these little films, these adult-oriented films, to even get an audience in theaters here. You wrote an article at the beginning of the month quoting Academy CEO Don Hudson and President David Rubin that this is a, quote, critical juncture in our Academy history. What were you getting at there? What are they getting at? Uh, I had an exclusive with them defending the uh, move of eight categories to the pre-show. They don't like that term, pre-show. And then editing the speeches into the actual broadcast to speed up the time of the show. Because they think it's crucial, number one, to keep the show at three hours. You've heard that year after year after year, and it never works. But now this is an attempt to do this, and they're not turning back. They also meant critical juncture because ABC you know, is sort of saying, we've lost so much audience here. We're paying you so much money. We need to get that audience back or it's going to go away. You know, that audience is going to go away. Well, let me ask you this. How many of those movies does the average person tuning in for the Oscars have seen? Uh, I Three? would say the average person tuning in, probably none Two? of them, maybe one of them. 
you know, or two, but that's not unusual. You know, I mean, yeah. a lot of yeah. times people tuned in, uh, it was a female driven event. They tuned in for the clothes, the fashions, that sort of thing. Now they see it so much. There's so many other places to see that it's not as special as it used to be. So it's a different thing for me though. It's always the movie, you know, when avatar was nominated for best picture and there were only five nominees that at that point that year, they changed it. When that was nominated, there was big tune in when black Panther was nominated in more recent years, the ratings were not astronomical, but they were not embarrassing, but that uh, gives um, the mass audience a rooting factor. Uh, there to tune in. Oh, I saw that movie. I want to see that movie when it's like any sporting event or anything like that. You're you're sitting there rooting for it. This is the Super Bowl of movies, but it doesn't treat it necessarily like a Super Bowl where the people tuning in take sides and things. If you haven't seen the movies or if you don't care, Belfast is a wonderful film, but it's a black and white movie set in 1969 that has made a handful of you know change at the box office here. So it's not widely seen by the mass audience. So you have to find other ways uh, to bring them in. Right. If, if you think in terms of a telecast, and we used to analyze this with the Emmy telecast, you take out all the commercials. Well, there's an hour yeah. right, of your three-hour show. You take away all the people walking up to the podium and walking <laughs> out of the audience to go up to the and hugging all their friends. By the time you got through taking all of the awards out, you had, you know, 20 minutes to entertain in three hours, right? right? So there's, there needs to be something. But I, I remember a time when we all looked forward, if Billy Crystal was going to be the host, we all looked forward to it because we knew it was going to be an amazing open to, to the show. Do you yeah. think, you know, Bill Maher complains that the, the Oscars have lost their ability to entertain. Do you think yeah. that's, that's missing? Uh, You know, every year, it's a thankless job to produce the Oscars, because either you're going to put the entertainment in and the music and the dance, and then people are going to say, why do they have to have all that music and dance? Why can't they just do the thing? You know, are you now going to take away eight awards and sort of edit them down and make them shorter, but put them in, give them their due, and they're going to get their whole experience, you know, in the hour before the show goes on. Then they say, Oh, that's disrespecting the film editors and the uh, sound mixers. These are the people that they would say normally, what do they need those awards on for? You know, why not that? The Oscars can never win in this way. They can, they will never win. Someone's going to always complain about something. It's great that they've gone back to hosts. We have three hosts this year. They're really promoting the hosts this year and uh, trying to bring people in because the last three years, uh, Jimmy Kimmel was the last host. I thought he did a good job, but you know, right. the ratings went down. And so they blamed it on the host. It wasn't the host. It's again, I'm going to say it's the movies, dummy. It's the movies. That's what's ultimately going to bring people back to theaters and back to the Oscars. Well, we have a situation both with the Emmys and the, uh, the Oscars where there are so many television programs. Now there was a time when we knew all the shows that were up for the Emmys. We knew most of the actors and the actresses. Then HBO came along. That was fine. That was assimilated. Now there are so many that many times the people walking out on stage are completely unfamiliar to the audience and the ratings kind of reflect that. Is there anything to be done or are we at a point where we're just going to say award shows are going to have limited audiences, not in the way we used to remember them, just as television doesn't have the audience, you know, the broadcast television doesn't have the audiences. What Is that a trend that we're not going to get away from? Yeah. The simple answer is yes. You you have to realize you're in a different time. And the viewing audience is split in many different ways. Uh, You can have award shows. And, you know, for people that want to watch it in in real time uh, on a network, you can still have that experience. But most of the younger consumers are watching it in bits and pieces that they find on the internet and different things are that you can just go to YouTube and watch whatever you want. Okay. I just want to watch this category or I want to see this and you'll catch and you can do it. You watch talk shows that way. That's, this is nothing different in the past few years. This is how people watch talk shows right? and the, and the network talk shows are savvy to it. Their social media is brilliant. James Corden and Jimmy Fallon, these guys were actual pioneers in taking the network experience 
and pushing it out to audiences that would never have seen it at the time on the network. And that that and that is true of award shows too for for a big chunk of the audience and so when you see the ratings going down i think it's hit bottom because last year was an aberration it was a terrible show and it was just like a terrible year and no one saw the movies and you were in your homes but hopefully this year it'll go back to at least something decent uh uh ratings wise but that won't tell the whole story it's how the show was consumed overall and we all know things are being consumed in a wildly different way by younger audiences now let's take a break our insider today is the hollywood legend pete hammond we'll be right back the insiders is proudly presented by cineonic cineonic's future ready enhanced services and technology solutions provide compelling cinema experiences peace of mind and financial flexibility today with more than 95,000 projectors installed globally cinemas around the world trust laser projection by cineonic to power the next generation of movie going visit cineonic.com today and discover why theaters look to cineonic to provide the solutions of tomorrow today Our guest today is writer Pete Hammond. Pete, production is at all times high right now, and there are many streaming services options to watch content. How do you see the future? Or at some point in time, do you think we're going to have fewer services? Are fewer shows going to be produced? Right now, I think we have too much content. And when you're talking about streaming, Netflix, like there's a lot of stuff I want to see on Netflix. And unless I keep a journal, and write down all that stuff after the first week or two of marketing of it, uh, when it debuts, I will forget it's in there. Paul Schrader, the great filmmaker, once told me, it all goes into the larder, as he put it, you know, and it's suddenly in there, in the thing. And you have to remember, oh, oh yeah, I wanted to see that one or whatever. You don't have the ability that theaters do, you know, with the standees and the posters and the coming attractions and all of that. You know, with streaming, you got to remember what they've got in there. And uh, it's a different experience. So there's wonderful movies on streaming, especially this time of year where they purposely put in their best stuff. Or they spend a fortune at festivals buying it like uh, $25 million for Coda because it did so well at Sundance. Think of a number when I ask you this question. How many streaming services is the average household really going to have an appetite to subscribe to? Right now, everybody's giving you these cheap deals and but what, what's your guess you know i'm the perfect person to ask that because i kept resisting all of it i had netflix and then i had the and then i realized wait a minute i need to get apple so i have one stop shopping and if i have apple not not necessarily the streaming service but the apple box it enables me to get all of these. And so I just keep piling them up and I don't look at the statements to see how much money I'm spending monthly on this, but I can tell you it's a lot because I feel like I have to have all of them. Each one of them will come on with something you just got to see. It's going to cost you $300 every month if you're really going to do this. And what family out there who's struggling with gas prices and everything else can do this? So they're going to find other ways or just cut it off. And so all, all, all of this will be for naught. And uh, maybe the networks will have a chance at coming back at the Emmys. Well, I, I came up in, in the industry in the cable, you know, broadcast and then cable. And I was at E! Entertainment during the early, early days. And there was a new cable channel launching every week. And I think we all kind of wondered how many cable channels <laughs> can people watch? Well, we learned a whole bunch of people will watch very little of each one. That's what you're going to have unless you've got a Kardashian show. Uh, um, yeah. So this it's feels so like that. feels like the 90s and cable. It's that every week there's a new streaming service and you go, okay, there are only so many eyeballs that can watch all this. When, From a, your perspective from Brussels, how many people, how many subscription services do you see a household wanting to spend money on? Well, I think it depends a little bit on the... Demographics. And if I look at Europe, for instance, there's a lot of the subscription services which are in the US, which are not existing in Europe yet, right? But I think that, of course, Netflix is all over all, all over the place, right? They're probably in the number one position, no doubt, especially with the youngsters, right? They, they love the Netflix uh, part and, and they, they jump in and out of a subscription, right? Just like that. I think Disney does, does absolutely well, right? 
And then you get to Apple, but but going beyond that, I think it gets tougher. And then you have to see where they have coverage, right, outside of US. So those are probably the top three which people are are very much connecting to if I take it outside of, of North America. Isn't it like the tail wagging the dog, though? The reason we have so many of these is because of Netflix, that success that they stumbled into and all of that. And then every major studio, which are they're still there, these studios, 20th Century Fox diminished, but nevertheless, they're still they're still there and they all have to have one. The only one that ironically doesn't, at least now, is Sony. And they're the ones that have been the most successful. Hmm. At the theaters, uh, <laughs> you know, with Spider, not just Spider Man, but, but Uncharted and and pretty much everything that they put up there, they're very careful about keeping the theatrical experience, and uh, they haven't fallen prey to having a streaming service uh, of their own that they can easily just say, oh, let's throw that one on the streaming service, or let's pump up the Peacock, or pump up this one by doing that they don't have that mindset so they've sold off a lot of movies to other services like amazon and things that they knew that would would be a waste of marketing dollars in this environment but nevertheless they don't have that temptation to put a lot of their product and you know into like uh, warner brothers did with hbo max for a year but it's true right i mean every company knows that that a focused strategy and doing what you're good at and being really lazy focused on that is a winning strategy, right? But then you got this thing which everybody seems to be making money on, and you cannot avoid getting into it. And then you know there's only probably from the 10 having a service like that, two or three is going to make good money, and the rest is going to be hanging in there, right? So so I think it, it's there's going to be a point in time, I believe, that people are going to realize that, right? And then they're going to be what I think Sony did very smart. They said, okay, this is where we're good at, you know, this is what we can cope with kind of thing. That's where we have budget for, because let's be honest, it is not a cheap endeavor to build a, a platform like you know Disney and others have done. So, so anyway, let, let's see, right? I mean, uh, we like the content. We want the content to come, but we want it to come to the cinemas, right, to the big screen, because that's where and I they, believe. And they can work together, but I mean, financially, it seems to me, I don't know how you monetize dumping something right onto Peacock, you know, without that theatrical, you know, also pushing it for recognition at the very least, and. Uh, and kind of credibility as as a movie, you know, but they don't release numbers. Maybe that's there's a reason they don't release numbers, real numbers. Of, of how when I meant. went back to the motion picture, you to back to the cinemas, the thing that shocked me after being away for so long was how much I missed the trailers. Yeah. Right? You have 25 minutes worth of fabulous trailers and you're saying, nope, don't care about that. Ooh, that looks pretty good. And you realize what a massive marketing machine for movies, the theater cinema experiences and you turn on Netflix and you see three Ryan Reynolds movies and you're saying, I think I read that this one's pretty good. I think, <laughs> but I don't, I don't know what the story is, etc. So that's there's exactly that. It. You know, that's exactly it. Look at a movie like free guy, which to their credit, Disney separated from their Fox deal, gave it a big thing. Now it's getting a sequel. It's theatrical. It made a ton of money this summer. People went out to theaters in a, in the very beginning of people going back to theaters and proved an original IP, as they say in the business, an original uh, movie. So, and I just interviewed Sean Levy, and he said, "I'm willing to do it all. I want theatrical, but I'm in business. He's he, he's v- very much in business with Netflix, and uh, you know he always says, you know, the Adam Project. Look, this is where we got the budget. This is where we got the movie. And to their credit, the streamers." definitely are providing big budgets or have been and getting movies made that wouldn't get made otherwise, most likely, because they're hungry for that. But at some point, you've got to get back to reality here. Only they know what the bottom line is financially, because they're, they're just holding it back. So we don't know how they're monetizing all of these films and what they're really making. I mean, the stars on the HBO Max Warner Brothers deal all were horrified. This was done without consultation with them or their agents. And so Warner Brothers, you know, paid big time in uh, <laughs> back end to allow that to happen. Now they've gone back to 45 day windows. Do directors, do the talent feel something about cinema? I know Denis felt it about Dune, you know, being on a streaming service. Is there a power base that want the cinema experience to survive? and thrive? And are they in a position to make that reality? 
well, for themselves, they're in a position to make it for reality. Christopher Nolan got very upset with Warner Brothers and uh, his home and um, moved his next project, Oppenheimer, over to Universal with an explicit deal for theatrical. He's one of the people that can do that and actually dictate the window and other things before he signs on. Um, obviously, there are the powerful directors like Steven Spielberg and James Cameron that can do the same thing. West Side Story was delayed a full year because Spielberg refused to put it on a streaming service or, or compromise that at all. Uh, and he wanted it the way he made that movie. These directors have a lot of power and, and new ones coming up, like a, I would say uh, coming in the future, John Watts, who directed the Spider-Man movies, came from a very small indie kind of world, Cop Car, great movie. If you haven't seen it, I put it on my top 10 four years ago. Now has the power, you know, if they wanna be in business with a guy like that, to uh, dictate like, well, the movie I make is for theatrical. I think we're gonna see more and more of that, not just these titans that can uh, call their own shots, at least until the movies don't do well. Then you have the Martin Scorsese's who seem to be comfortable going wherever he can get the money to make his vision and the time. So Killers of the Flower Moon, I've heard is $200 million budget, then they knocked it down to 150. And, you know, that's coming up with Leonardo DiCaprio and, you know, um, Adam McKay taking Don't, Don't Look Up to Netflix and getting Meryl Streep and Leo and Jennifer Lawrence and on and on, you know, uh, it's up to these directors to play where they can in the sandbox that will allow them to do their vision. I think ultimately to a lot of them like Scorsese, let me get the movie made. You know, I want to make this movie. I want to make the Irishman and I have all this technology. It's going to cost a fortune. Well, you know, Netflix wants to be in business with those people. So uh, until the next time, because they, they realize ultimately the bottom line may not pay off for them and, they, and they've got to stop somewhere, somewhere along the line. Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson, watch that, watch this space. Now Amazon has taken over MGM, the 95th place that has taken over MGM. And, um, but among that is the, the thing they wanted was the James Bond franchise. Well, they have to hold their ground because they are, if they give way, on James Bond and say, okay, now they're going to make a bunch of television series and they're going to do this with James Bond and they're all going to blah, 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 blah. Then that's trouble. You know, you have to have those people that are willing to believe in the theatrical experience with the crown jewels, holding the crown jewels and make sure it doesn't get screwed up. You have richly earned the title of legend today with <laughs> us. Thank you, Pete Hammond. You. This is absolutely fantastic. Good luck this week. Thank you for everything you do. And please come back. You're, you're such a joy to have. Oh, thanks, man. It was fun. Wonderful. Uh, Wim and I will be right back. Hey, listeners, the Insider Show podcast is going to Las Vegas and Caesars Palace for the annual CinemaCon meeting beginning April 25th. We'll have studio insiders and cinema owners gathering together to talk about what's coming to your movie theater soon. So join us. Wim uh, Pete Hammond is a, is a force of nature. That was, uh, a, real character, that was yes. a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought it was interesting that he said that industry insiders that he's talking to think there's almost too much production going on. That was an interesting That there's one. too yes. much content being made. And that's what you and I've kind of talked about, which was how many, how many shows or movies can you watch? And how many streamings, how many services can, can you take? And he seemed to, to he did say that people who are actually making the content think there's almost too much content being made and that this kind of investment can't, can't sustain itself, right? No, and, and I think part of the industry is about, and, and, and this is also what I like on the cinema, I think it, it's a social experience, right? You go there together. But part of the industry watching a movie is that you want more people have watched it. You want to be able to discuss it, right? When you're the only one have, watching, have watched it because you, you know, everybody has to look at different content because there's so many content, then you lose the power of the movies. And now watching it on which, you know, a platform is one element, but I think the fact that everybody has seen Spider-Man or everybody has seen Dune or whatever uh, allows to 
you know, create opinions about it. There are others to, to discuss, uh, you know, and, and even if you talk about the Oscars, you know, and, and you, you have to have seen the movie, you have to be able to talk about it to, to express it and appreciate it. And I think that's what we will lose when there's too many streaming services and too much content and, and people have not the grip. Today I have already people say, well, but, but that's on Apple, that's on, on Disney or that's on Netflix. Well, I have not had the time to see it, right? And that's right. a shame, yeah. The other thing that, that comes through in a conversation like this is there is a very established cinema business model. Spider-Man is a highly profitable movie, right? They, they are, it's making money. The streaming services are all showing losses because they're investing in all this content and they are not getting that profit back yet. So the one thing that you look out at the year ahead and you say, if you are looking for a business model that's going to bring you back hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of profit on a single title, the cinema business model is a strong, strong model. You know, you're right, Jim. And I think, you know, there were years back that people said, well, when you make a movie, you never know it's going to hit well, right, kind of thing. And many people want to watch it. And there's a category where that definitely plays. But then there's also a category category where you definitely know it's going to do well, right? I do like also the fact that we need to get this middle group of content there getting to the big screen because, you know, we need to have diversity. But if you know that you're going to get 10 times a great run, then you can afford, of course, bringing smaller things in and try out with that, right? Yeah. So why don't we close today our quote of the day from uh, Avatar actress Zoe Zeldania. Here's what she said after seeing 20 minutes of Jim Cameron's Avatar 2, which is coming this December. She said, it's powerful, it's compelling. I can get choked up just talking about it. I was moved to tears. I think you really have to brace yourself for this. It's going to be an adventure that you will not forget. Wow. Thanks to Pete Hammond. Thank you, Wim. And thank you all for listening. The Insiders is presented by Cineonic and produced by the Advanced Imaging Society in Hollywood. Our executive producers are Adam Castles in New York and Mike Piltzecker in Los Angeles. Brett Harrison produced today's show and our technical director is Matthew Bach Lombardo. This is AIS.